Thank you, Jim. Appreciate it. Uh, we're going to shift uh, areas a little bit now, and we're going to talk about uh, maybe a, a little broader issues. Uh, chemistry and a lot of other sciences underlying a lot of those issues, but uh, I'm not going to give you a lot of details about my own research or about others, but a lot of the things we will be talking about do come from a very long line of uh, investigations. Let me start by saying that about a year and a half ago, maybe a little, a little more now, um, IFT put together a group. IFT is the Institute of Food Technologists, and, and some of you probably are members of that organization, but uh, put together a group to really address some of the major issues that pertain to our food supply, uh, major issues about our food system. The reason that we did that, um, it's, it's the, actually many reasons. So uh, here's a, some, uh, an outline of, of why we undertook that uh, uh, really review and, and scientific uh, look into the food system. We were dealing with uh, consumer issues, a um, lot of concerns about food safety, a lot of concerns about processed foods, what's in my processed food, um, how can we feed people, uh, what's in my food supply, will we have food in the future, how does food processing and food production affect the environment, how does it compare with energy, on top of that, we have a whole series of popular publications from books to um, articles in newspapers to uh, uh, movies uh, and so on and so forth that in one way or another, <clears throat> they actually present opinions partly based on science, partly not, uh, partly uh, really helping, partly not. A lot of it is probably misinformation misunderstanding. Uh, some of it is actual and true and, and uh, objective information. So that was another reason we wanted to, uh, to set the record straight. And finally, uh, the, the other issue that we were concerned with, uh, which is general for, for science and, and technology, uh, but it's more acute when you look at agricultural science and food science, including the chemistry behind it. Uh, the funding for such research has really declined severely over the last few decades, and it has come to the point where uh, we really need to reconsider what we do with funding of such research and what we do to support our, our system. So here's an example of some of the information I was uh, referring to before that is published in popular books. One of them is Michael Pollan's in defense of food. And Michael Pollan is a very smart individual and he does a lot of good things. Uh, but when he says, don't eat anything that won't eventually rot, it's a very catchy, very simplistic way to really tell people something that's actually pretty wrong. Because we actually have a lot of foods that will not rot. They're designed not to rot. If you reduce the moisture enough, no microbes will grow. And if you get the activity of the water in the right place, not only the microbes will not grow, but many of the chemical and biochemical reactions will be minimized. So those foods, and several of those are actually natural foods, from dry nuts to honey to on and on. So many of those foods are actually very good for you. So when you say, don't eat anything that will not eventually rot, it's a simplistic statement that catches people's attention, but I'm not sure it's very helpful. Another statement, just as an example. Eat like your great-grandmother ate. Think back to your great-grandmothers. Would you want to be like that? My great-grandmother doesn't live to be more than 40 years old. They suffered from all kinds of avitaminosis and other food-related diseases. Do we want to go back to that, really? So there's simplistic statements that capture our imagination. We want to live like the good old days, but should we, really? So these are some of the things that really uh, told us that we need to uh, look into some things. So what I want to do today here is really um, 
take some of the, the information from that paper and combine it with a lot of other information and, and really give you a, 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 sort of a, a peace of mind or, or a few positions and a few ideas about where we are in terms of our food system, how it has become to, to what we know today, and what may become in the future. But before I do that, I want to really uh, very briefly outline some of, the some of the challenges that we're facing today uh, in terms of food in particular. So Jim mentioned earlier uh, the issues that we're facing because of increasing population. But there's a lot of other things on top of an increased population. For example, we lose a lot of food, and I'll mention that in just a minute. All across the world, a lot of the food that is produced at the farm never makes it to the table. We also see very huge changes in terms of what people consume here in the U.S. as well as elsewhere. So we'll talk some about some of that as well. Uh, we see change, changing trends, what the consumers want when it comes to food. So we'll, we'll talk quickly about that. So let me address those four first, and then we'll continue on with the rest of some of those challenges. So you saw the, 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 um, the line of how human population increased. And I also uh, you know, know that many of you have heard this many, many times. But when I look at this graph, I can't help thinking that this is an explosion that took place about a couple of hundred years ago. It wasn't just an increase. It was really an exponential increase, and in many cases actually resembles microbial growth. So for those of you that have biology and microbiology background, you know what follows, right? So the point is, if you look back in history, about 10,000 years ago, people have estimated that we really had less than 10 million people living on the planet. In a few years from now, it may be 2050, it may be 2070, it may be 2100, 2100, we will have 10 billion people. That's a huge change. The planet hasn't changed, it's still the same planet. The other thing that I want you to note is that this increase in the population is no longer happening the same way it used to. We now have all of that growth today and in the future. It will take place in urban settings. We will have creation of megacities of 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 million people. The rural population has stopped changing in terms of numbers and it's not going to increase. So not only we have more people to feed, but we must feed them in those very large cities. So the food has to come to that place. We know that of the about seven billion people that we have on Earth today, about one of those billion people go to sleep hungry just about every day. So even today cannot feed all of our people. Not because we don't have enough food necessarily, but because of a lot of other issues. So accounting for that and realizing that it's not the same all across the globe. It's not the same in the U.S., it's not the same in Europe, it's not the same in Asia, it's not the same in Latin America or Africa. The food system has to account for much of that if we are to really feed 9 or 9.5 nine or 10 billion people um, by 2050 or so. Here's another element of change. In China, for example, uh, back in 1980, the average consumption of meat, it was 20 kilos per capita. By, 20, uh, by 2007, that has, had increased to 50 kilos per capita, two and a half times. And that increase continues today. So not only will we have to produce more food, but we will have to produce more of specific foods, such as proteinaceous material. And as you see next to that, it's a lot more difficult, a lot more resource demanding to produce meat than to produce crops or other uh, food. So not only we need to produce more food, the different kinds of food, but we need to intensify because we will need more resources if, if we were to produce that food. 
Recently, uh, the Institution of Mechanical Engineering from the UK, they put together a little, a little um, uh, paper and they described their uh, research and their ideas of how much food is actually lost on the planet. And they started uh, by really estimating that something between 30 to 50 percent of the food that we produce at the farm actually never gets consumed. Now, some of it is in developing countries. Uh, in this particular case, for example, they say that in Southeast Asian countries, losses of rice can range from 37 to 60 percent. That's a significant amount of food that we lose today. Here's another example. In India, 21 million tons of wheat is wasted each year. That's a lot of wheat. It can make a lot of flour, a lot of bread. But the same can be said about the Western countries, the developed countries. We may not waste as much between farm and the grocery store or the farm and the consumer, but we do waste quite a bit at the grocery store level and at the consumer level. In the UK, for example, they're saying that uh, 7 million tons of food valued at approximately 10 billion pounds, it's about 15 or 16 billion dollars, is thrown away every year. Here's some data from the US. Uh, this is a study that was done um, a few years back. It used data from 1995. So in 1995, it was estimated that about almost 100 billion pounds of food was lost. 27% of the total amount of food that we produce. A very significant amount. Similar studies and, and more recent ones using 1998 data if you can see the numbers there, they pretty much show very similar things. The, the total number here is 29% of the food that we produce gets lost. Now, if you look at that, and I don't want you necessarily to look at all these numbers, but the range is significant. It starts from 10 to 15 and goes all the way up to 30 or 40. Here's a 41, for example, for poultry. Several of the fruits and vegetables, they're, they're about 30%. But when you start looking within individual commodities, the range is even bigger. You can get from 10 to 60 or 65%. And this is right here in the US. So uh, Busby uh, is the author of this, of this um, uh, recent paper. She actually suggested that there's a way to go about reducing those losses. Obviously, we have a lot of technology that we need to look at from the farm to, uh, to the consumer, but there's also a lot of things that we can do at the consumer level. And she suggested that if we looked at specific items, such as apples and grapes and peaches and strawberries, which for most of them, the loss is 50 or 60 percent, uh, we can actually make uh, a bigger impact if we were trying to reduce losses for those uh, items. Similar things for some of the vegetables. The, the most important vegetables is tomato, are tomatoes and potatoes, both fresh as well as canned and frozen. So if we were to concentrate on those commodities, we might be able to, to save a lot of that food. So let's look at some of the other uh, challenges we're facing. Limited natural resources. Well, we don't have more water. Maybe we can desalinate some, but that's a very expensive technology, and we will be able to use it to drink maybe in the future, and, and in some areas of the planet that's the case today. But if you were to desalinate water to really grow food, that will be a very expensive proposition today. It may become less expensive tomorrow, but uh, still we're very far from creating, so to speak, new water. So water is limited. So is soil. We can't create new soil. We have to find ways to preserve that soil. Energy is an issue. We can't continue to waste energy. We need to produce bioenergy, as, as uh, you heard earlier, and you will hear again uh, from another talk. And some of the productions we have need to go maybe to that, that route. But all of those, all of our natural resources are limited, and we need to take that into account. We also have a very limited area where we can produce food and uh, I'll show you some examples in just a minute. Uh, here's uh, the population estimates that we talked about before, but when you look at developing countries, uh, the projections are that by 2050, 
they will go to about seven and a half billion people. If you look at the land per capita that's available in those countries to grow food, uh, you see we moved from 0.3 hectares back in 1960 to about half of that uh, in year 2000, and it will com continue to, to get reduced. So we have a lot le le less land today to produce the food for the people that occupy the planet. Uh, you, you need to do that by many ways. You can't just continue to, to find new land because we're not going to find much more. Uh, if you look back, you're going to find out that yields in many of the major crops have increased. In this particular case, you see some examples uh, for corn, rice, and wheat. And if you look at uh, any one of those lines, what you will see is that within the, next, the last 40 or 50 years, uh, the amount of product produced per unit of, of area, it basically doubled. If we assume that we can do the same thing again, we can probably double the amount of many of those crops as we move forward. If our agricultural scientists, if our agronomists and plant pathologists really do a good job, and, and uh, entomologists, with a lot of chemistry, all of them, uh, the question, though, is can we continue to, to double our production? And are we investing in that today uh, in terms of uh, research, in terms of, uh, in terms of dollars? So uh, let me uh, make a couple more comments here, and then we'll move on to another subject. So we talked about all sorts of different challenges at the beginning, but we haven't mentioned much about the climate. The climate is, is something that we have to account for. There is no question that we have changes that we need to deal with. Some of those changes are temperature related, some of those changes are water related, rainfall. Some of those changes are really the fluctuation of things. And plants are designed you know, to withstand very large fluctuations. So the question is, how can we develop new germplasm that is, is more resistant to drought and at the same time more resistant to larger temperature fluctuations? Uh, a lot of that work will be extremely important in how our future food system responds uh, to things. Bioenergy, I mentioned a couple of things uh, on bioenergy, so I'm not going to belabor that because it's another talk. Health and wellness and food safety. Let me briefly touch on those two things. Health and wellness. Uh, some of you may have seen this cartoon that comes from year 2000. This is the New Yorker, March 13 of 2000. And it was really the time that obesity actually became, to be, became a, a very real issue in, in the U.S. It's, it's the evolution of the human being, if you like. Uh, we have grown to the point where uh, maybe we're not going to grow taller anymore, but we're going to grow in other dimensions. So is this what we have to deal with? Is this what we, we have to put up with, rather? Uh, this is another issue that our food system needs to acknowledge and really deal with. On, on, on one hand, we have people that do not have enough to eat. On the other, maybe we're consuming a, a lot more than we need in certain uh, uh, parts of the planet. So how do we deal with that? At the, at the same time, not everybody is actually um, um, has the same needs when it comes to food. We're all different. So we'll come back to that in just a minute. In terms of food safety, uh, we have really done a lot of really good work in terms of science and technology to prevent our food supply from getting uh, to the point where it will, it will be uh, uh, non-edible. Uh, we've reduced uh, all kinds of diseases because of uh, uh, unsafe food. And today, at least in this country and the Western world, we have probably the safest food supply we've ever had in our history. We need to continue to do that, particularly now with the bigger demands we have in terms of quantity, uh, particularly with the globalization of society and the globalization of the food system, a lot more demands uh, for really a more safe, more secure, more traceable uh, food. Here's a, here's a quick example of what I mean by complexity. Uh, this was published a few uh, years ago in Food Technology. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a very simple uh, observation, but it's very telling. A simple cup of soup. It could be the soup that you make at home, or in this case, we're talking about the soup that you buy in the, in the grocery store. It usually has about 40 basic ingredients. 
from meat and meat-related products to vegetables and all sorts of things to spices to all maybe 40 maybe 30 maybe 50 depending on, on what it is those 40 basic ingredients were produced by 500 different companies that they are all ac across the globe that's a very global food system this is what we have today so Let's look at that food system a little closer in a historical perspective. How did it come to this point? How did it develop to this point? Winston Churchill once said that the further backward you're, you can look, the further forward you're likely to see. So I'm going to start very, very far in, 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 in history, very uh, further back. Uh, we're going to go probably uh, two to three million years ago, and they were going to progress very quickly. What was happening about two to three million years ago? Well, Richard Wrangham, which is a Harvard University biological anthropology, anthropologist, he published a really interesting book uh, two or three years ago talking about how fire and really the discovery of cooking with fire really transformed our species. Why? Because all of a sudden, um, um, we didn't have to have you know, really big and strong teeth to, to eat the food that we caught or, or we, we hunted. Uh, but rather, we, we change the physiology of the, of the, of the human uh, uh, species. And he has actual evidence to, to show that. I mean, he can, you can see that around that time, uh, the human skull changed, the brain became uh, bigger, uh, cooking uh, actually made many of the uh, um, uh, nutrients more bioavailable, and so on and so forth. So cooking was really the first basis for, um, for science to, to, that enter into, uh, into the, our food system. Now let's move forward quickly now, but still in prehistoric times. And some of the codes that I, uh, that I have here are from the paper that I mentioned before, uh, the IFT paper. So much later, but still in prehistoric times, cooking was augmented by fermenting, drying, preserving with salt, and other primitive forms of food processing, which allowed groups and communities to form and survive. You know, we start gathering together. We start forming a society, if you like. Socially, we've changed. Humans thus first learned how to cook, then how to transform, preserve, and store it safely. And here's the beginnings of chemistry. Now let's move forward quite a bit. Instead of millions of years ago, let's, let's come to a few thousand years ago. It doesn't matter what ancient civilization you study, but no matter what ancient civilization you look at, what you will find is that throughout our history as humans, we overcame hunger and disease, not only by harvesting food from a cultivated land, by then we did have cultivation, but also by processing it with sophisticated methods. And processing, as you've seen earlier with chocolate and coffee and everything else, processing is a lot of chemistry. It's also a lot of physics and a lot of engineering. So I'm going to take a quick example. Uh, my roots are Greek, so I'm going, to, I'm going to choose ancient Greece. They had three very basic food in Greece back then. They had bread, olive oil, and wine. Now, can you think of any product that resembles wheat. Bread comes from wheat, but it has so many steps between the original material and the final product. Very different, much more nutritious. Uh, so they took a barely edible product, wheat, and transformed it into a very nutritious product, bread. Same thing with olive oil. Actually, olives are non-edible unless you actually process them, handle them in a way to make them uh, edible. And olive oil is today one of the best foods when it comes to uh, a healthy diet. Wine. You start with a very good product, grapes, but it's very perishable. If you, if you harvested the grapes, they're going to last a week or two, maybe a month. That's the most of it. But if you turn it into wine, not only you have a completely different product with completely different taste and, and flavor and nutrient profile, but it will last for a long, long time. So processing becomes really uh, the way to advance as a society. So let's come a little closer. 
Uh, this is just um, a couple hundred years ago in France during Napoleonian times. Uh, Nicolas Saper was the one that started canning. And it was really the basis of what everybody calls today uh, the contemporary science of food. Uh, later on, Pasteur will figure out why uh, canning actually worked. But Aper, Nicolas Aper was the one to figure out how you take a food product, you put it in a glass jar or a can, and you can then heat it, sterilize it, and you can preserve it for a long, long time. And that had a huge effect on how we feed our people. So, we started with fire, we progressed through a lot of different steps, and we've come to contemporary, uh, the contemporary food system. Um, I want to look a little bit into the, the food system of today, and then I'm going to move on uh, to say a few uh, things about the future. If we look at how the system changed very recently, the last few decades, and, and Jim mentioned that earlier, you go back to 40s and 50s, um, we actually implemented a lot of different changes in our agriculture and our food. And if you look at this graph, basically what it says is with the same amount of inputs in terms of energy, in terms of water, in terms of soil, in terms of all kinds of things, we actually now can produce two and a half times more food than what we could 50 or 60 years ago. And as we said, the question is, can we do this again over the next 50 or 60 years? Will we be able to continue this trend that I showed you before for all the major crops, particularly when our investment in research is going down, particularly when globalization is taking place, particularly when we have diseases that are threatening some of our major crops and we still don't have good solutions for those diseases. Um, there's, the, for, for, one time, some, some of our plant pathologists were explaining to me that if you look at the amount of money we invest in, in uh, medicine, what we're trying to do there, obviously, is trying to take care of human health. But this is only for one species. In agriculture, we deal with many species. And in, case of, in the case of plants, we're dealing with species that have no immune system. So it's a much more complicated, pathologically speaking, issue to, to really work around and, and resolve. But let me give you some other examples, because a lot of things that we're talking about have real numbers behind it. This is the case of milk. How do we produce milk? Obviously from the cow. Well, we used to have a lot more cows than we have today. But we produce a lot more milk today than, than decades ago. Why? Because we actually learn how to use the cow to produce more milk. It's as simple as that. Here's, here's how we do it. We used to have to feed the cow, and most of that food, most of that energy that went into the cow, it actually went towards sustaining the animal. That hasn't changed. We still need about the same amount of energy to sustain the animal. But if you look at that, the, the top of the graph, the gray, is the energy that goes towards milk production. So it used to be, of the total energy that we put into the cow, two-thirds will be sus for sustenance, one-third will be for milk. Now it's almost the other way around. Two-thirds go towards milk production, one-third is for su sustenance. The interesting part is when you look at environmental impact, for example. If you look at the CO2 produced per cow, for example, it has actually gone up. This is the first two bars there. So somebody might say that this is bad for the environment. But keep in mind, we have less cows today and we produce a lot more milk. So when you look at it in terms of how much CO2 we produce per kg of milk, which is really the reason we have cows in the first place, then you will see a completely different picture. So environmentally, the system has become much better. It's, we have to feed a lot more people. We need a lot more milk. Now, I'm, I'm putting this here because, um, again, there's a lot of people out there that mean well, but a lot of the information that gets out, it's, it's not necessarily uh, objective. So one of our former presidents, Dwight Eisenhower, said, uh, farming looks mightily easy when your plow is a pencil and you're a thousand miles from the cornfield. It was true back then, it's true today. It's not easy to grow those crops. It's not easy to grow those animals. It's not easy to take that food from the farm and bring it to the consumer. It takes a lot of science and a lot of technology and a lot of energy and a lot of, a lot of effort. 
Here's some examples of how efficiency has been weaved into the system. When you make cheese, there's a lot of whey that goes away. We used to throw that away. We don't anymore. We actually, for a period of time, the green line there, we would use that whey, those whey proteins to, to feed the animals. And that was some use. But now we can derive from those whey proteins all kinds of ingredients, from whey protein concentrate, concentrates to lactose to a lot of other things. Those, as ingredients, then go back into the food system. That's efficiency. Surimi is another example. We will take a lot of fish tissue that was thrown away and we can create new products. Here's another example. Mechanically deboned meat, which probably many of you have heard the news a few months ago or last year. It was pink slime, right? Pink slime is deboned meat. It's actually very high quality, very high protein content meat but it was shut down because of the press. As a result, we don't have that product now as part of our burgers, so we pay more for the burger and we consume burgers that have higher fat. So here's an efficiency that was taken out of the food system. A lot of other examples, and I'm not gonna go into much detail, but here's um, uh, ready to eat salads. A lot of work has gone into that to really reduce the transpiration and respiration rates of fresh fruits. And you know, you can now have a fresh salad that has a shelf life of three to four weeks so that you can get it from California to New York or from Mexico to Canada and so on and so forth. Uh, as a result, that industry alone is now nearly $25 billion in the U.S. You know, the ready to eat fresh pre-prepared, minimally processed vegetables. Uh, same thing for apples. We've done a lot of work with ready-to-eat, pre-prepared, cut apples and, and a lot of other fruit. And obviously you've seen a lot of the salads and a lot of those products out there too. This is a product that didn't exist. It reduces losses and it's actually a product that uh, helps our goals towards form forming a better food system. So processing with all it encompasses chemistry and physics and biology and engineering, there's a reason for it. It preserves, it creates safe food, better quality, it improves the nutrition. Think of vitamin D in milk, for example, or niacin in bread. How could we fight many of those diseases if it wasn't for processing? So a lot of different things happen for a reason. But today's food system also is what I call uh, ha is facing a lot of dichotomies. And we mentioned some of those. Some people are comfortable with the global food system. They can eat food from across the globe. Some people are not so comfortable. They choose local. And we have to respect that. Some people like fast food, or even if they don't like it, they eat it. Some people don't. They like the slow, easy going, Louisiana style. High-tech versus low-tech, new and improved versus traditional, ready-to-eat versus natural, whatever that means. Uh, low price versus premium price. People don't mind paying a lot of money for some, for some of their food. Others do. So a lot of different types of movements that are pulling the food system in a lot of different directions, sometime this way, sometime this way. A couple of examples. We used to eat eggs and an egg was an egg. But these days, an egg is not an egg. Now we have eggs that are brown and small and large, and eggs that come from chickens that are free range, and eggs that have been fed four different types of cereals, and eggs that actually were laid in a straw bed, and on and on and on. Specificity about what people want. The food system needs to provide that. And then a lot of people are into whole foods. Again, whatever that might mean. Local foods, we mentioned before, and also fresh. And many people don't realize that a lot of fresh foods are not exactly fresh, unless you go and pick it yourself. That fresh, that term, is very mm, shady. You produce apples once a year, but we have fresh apples all around the year, right, as an example. 
So we have moved to other different things. Organic is a big growth area, for example, for food. Sustainable is another. Uh, a lot of times now people say, forget organic, let's just eat local. Again, whatever local means. It may be 10 miles, it may be 100 miles, it may be 1,000 miles, but nevertheless. Um, so a lot of different things that have pulled the system to where it is today. So the question is, where do we go from here? Will we continue to transport food long distances, for example, if energy continues to go up? Well, here's, here's a good example to answer some of those questions. Um, a lot of the local food movement comes partly for the quality of the food and partly for the environment. So this is towards the environment. The final delivery of a food is about 1,000 miles on average today in the US. This is US-based food system. For the total life cycle, if you start from scratch and, and go to the consumer, it will be about 4,200 miles. Now, what does that mean? When you look at the greenhouse gases that are emitted for the whole part of the food system, what you will see is that about 84% of that is because of agricultural production. The final transportation is 7% for the supply chain, 4% for the final delivery, and 5% for wholesaling and retailing. So if you were to make a huge impact in terms of environmental impact, you need to concentrate on agriculture. You need to concentrate on that 84%. You need to produce food which is most effective and most efficient to, to produce it. And if local is it, then that's the case. But in many cases, it's not. All right, a little bit about the future. I have just a few more minutes. So we're going we're gonna to move forward, and we're going to have nine, nine and a half, maybe 10 billion people at some point down the line. Uh, and and there, certain estimations have been made, fairly simple calculations, actually. I mean, if you look at the projections, which is the blue part, and wh where we are today, the red part, and you just simply look at the integration of that space under there, if, if this was food produced, uh, basically the calculation shows that over the next 50 to 60 years, we're going to have to produce as much food as we've ever produced in our human history. Just in the next 50 years. That's a daunting task. It's a lot of food to be produced with the same resources. I'm going to skip this, but it's a good quote from uh, one, one of our other presidents because I'm running out of time. So how do we address those, those challenges? What do we do? How do we solve all these problems? The great challenges we talked about, you know, diet and disease, because we know diabetes is here. We know uh, obesity is here. We know that we have all sorts of uh, diseases that they're not necessarily just the food related, but they connect to food directly. Uh, we, have, we have a lot of promising technologies. Here's some very quick examples. Resistant starch. This is a starch that res resists digestion. So this goes to a lot of different things. A lot of work being done in this area. A lot of chemistry is being done in this area. And it's a very promising technology. We have done some work with actually using starch, turn it into spherulitic material, and using those spherulides to really uh, uh, enclose certain very sensitive compounds so that we can use it to deliver those nutrients in the right place in the body or to protect them against all sorts of things. So this is another example of a technology. Uh, some people at Penn State, where I was um, uh, just uh, less than a year ago, uh, they have come up with a very intriguing method to have mushrooms with very high uh, amounts of vitamin D. We all need a little more vitamin D. It's one of the, the things that we need. Uh, we've also worked on a lot of different issues, including more selenium, another very uh, interesting nutrient that we all need. Uh, and, and part of that is because of good edible coatings for mushrooms. Probiotics, uh, a lot of interesting work in that bigger area of probiotics. Uh, you probably heard, heard the, uh, the statistic that uh, the human body is made out of about 10 billion microbial cells. We actually have more microbial cells in us than human cells. So it was, we're really a symbiotic organism. So probiotics and how we feed those bacteria inside our, our, our body is a very, very critical element. 
Uh, a lot of interesting in nanotechnology, and I've seen several presentations here too. Uh, this is uh, some of our work about active packaging and controlled release packaging, extremely interesting uh, technology for the future. And then a lot of other things which I'm, I'm going to skip for the sake of time, from biotechnology-based changes to biochemistry to material science, process and process engineering, as I mentioned, molecular biology and, and microbial ecology, nanotechnology, nutritional genomics, it's a huge area of, of interest. Personal, personalized nutrition, I mentioned earlier that you know, we all go to a store and we get our shoes, shoes that fit us. But we don't do that with food, do we? Very few groups actually now have specially made foods for them. I think in the future we will see more of that. Just like we have baby food and food for diabetics and food for some, somebody else, we will have more of that kind of approach to things. I'll go back to this, uh, um, the two uh, issues that, that stress the food system. Uh, actually, the many issues that stress the food system. They pull it to different poles. It's a multipolarism. Or, or, or the system will have to respond to that, but we can't forget the middle because a lot of us were right in the middle. The bottom line, uh, as I said, about 50 or 60 years from now, the population will increase. We will demand a lot more food, roughly about 100% more. But we're not going to be able to produce that food from the same land, the same water, and the same energy we have today. Much of that will have to come from increased efficiencies. Much of that will have to come for applying science and technology. And if we can't fund that, and if we, if we don't have a societal response to that, I don't think we're going to be able to do it. But my guess is most of that uh, response will come within the next decade or so. And, and we'll have a pretty good idea as to where we're going to be by 2050. So I'm going to stop here because my time has run out. And I'm going to turn it back to Jim. Thank you.